Hi, and welcome to this part two of our video that's all about the universal cylindrical grinder. Now, when we left off in part one, we were looking at this, and we mentioned that there are several ways of offsetting these universal cylindrical grinders. We had the headstock that could be offset, we had the upper table that could be offset, and we had our grinding wheel or workhead that could be offset. Now, if there are three ways of offsetting this machine, well, there must be reasons why. So we'll be taking a look at that. We're also going to take a look at RPM for cutting in different applications. We're going to be looking at feeds. And we're also going to be looking at grinding wheel wear and how that works. So those things we'll be looking at. And also, if we looked at why we can offset and we looked at offsetting well we can also say that it's going to be very important to align as well so towards the end of the video we'll be looking at that let's take a look at why so many components of this machine can be offset and let's start with offsetting the upper table Now, if I offset the table like that, it's probably because I want to cut a taper. A few things need to be said here. First, the angle of the table has nothing to do with the angle of the reciprocating movement here. So the table will still feed back and forth parallel to the subtable or the lower table the top table or the upper table, it will be at an angle. And that means that if I'm holding apart between centers and I'm cutting parallel movement with the lower table and angular disposition with the upper table, well this end of the part that will be held between centers is going to end up being smaller than this end. I'll have cut a taper. Something like this MT3, Morse taper number three. They're very gradual and slight tapers. They're self-locking. And that is the type of work that I'm going to want to do by offsetting the table. Because I can't offset it by 90 degrees. It just won't work. Now this is for small amounts of offset for very, very accurate tapers. Another reason why this table is adjustable, well, it is to get parts incredibly parallel as well. So if I can offset this to get a part, uh, to get a very accurate taper on a part, well I can reset it to get a very parallel part. I can also offset the headstock. And why would I want to do that? Well I'd want to do that in order to cut uh, more pronounced tapers. Uh, as an example here, my table is aligned and even if it wasn't it's not that important. I'm going to have a parallel motion and I have a center mounted in the headstock. And this is the perfect setup and I've done this many times to grind your centers or your center in this case to ensure that it is perfectly or at least as concentric with the headstock's axis as possible. So you can see here that by using a reciprocating motion, I could use the, the grinding wheel to come and grind that surface, the surface of that center at 60 degrees. I can't get 60 degrees with the table, so I wouldn't use that technique. But to cut 60 degrees, I would use this technique. However, once I've ground this center, if I leave the part at an angle because I have something else to do, well, I obviously won't be able to hold things between centers. So usually I just offset it to grind my center, but if I'm going to be producing parts, well, I wouldn't use the center at all. I'd use a four-jaw chuck or some other device to hold the operation, to hold the part for a chucking operation. As mentioned before, if we offset the grinding wheel, or the work head of the grinding wheel, 
Well, one of the main reasons is to rotate 180 degrees to present the internal grinding uh, wheel uh, to the part to be machined. But besides that, we can also offset to produce certain angles, angles on my grinding wheel. So if I offset the grinding wheel, let's say at 45 degrees, and this is just eyeing it out, but I could do it accurately, and I mount my diamond dresser on the table. Now I know that even if this is offset, the diamond dresser is going to move parallel to the table and the lower table. And even if the upper table was offset slightly, I could still uh, clean up my grinding wheel with my diamond dresser and get it parallel to the lower table. So it's really the lower table that controls the flatness and parallelism, oh my god, of the grinding wheel there. So if I set up like this and I come and grind a uh, dress or dress up the wheel here, I'm going to produce an angle on the wheel. I'm going to end up here with something, if I just dress a small amount, something like this 45 degree angle on the part here. And what could that be for? Well, let's say that I grind my 45 degree on the grinding wheel. I dress it off with the diamond tip dresser. Then I bring my wheel back. And now I come and dress the face to make sure that it is nice and flat. I'll end up with a grinding wheel that has a slight 45 degree angle on it and a nice flat surface. And with this part, well, I could come and grind a part between centers that would need to be parallel for most of its length and maybe end up with a small chamfer at the very end. And that's what the 45 would give me. In other words, I can do a progressive uh, lateral cutting here on my face and I can use this to plunge in and finish a chamfer all in one uh, simple operation. And that is what the offsetting of the work wheel, the grinding wheel, is most often used for. It's used for dressing a wheel at a certain angle. Let's say I wanted a 30 degree angle there. Well, I could come and plunge with a 30 degree angle here. I could come and plunge on my center and grind my center that way if I wanted to. So, that is why we have so many ways of offsetting this machine because there's a lot of different situations that require different approaches. Some of you may have figured out that offsetting the grinding wheel in order to grind, to dress off an angle, in other words to make a form wheel out of it, something like this here, well, it is expensive because you have to lop off a large portion of your grinding wheel. And well, if you do that and you want to get it straight again, well, you're going to have to lop off the rest of that. It gets small quickly. So what you want to do for that is have a selection of grinding wheels that have already been used for the specific purpose. So you might have one with a 30 degree on it for grinding centers, plunge grinding centers. You may have one with a 45 degree for grinding specific chamfers, plunging in. And you can keep those aside. Now when you mount the wheel back on the machine, you're still going to have to use the diamond dresser to dress it final. But since it's already at its angle, all you have to do is really take very little off, a couple of thousandths of an inch usually, just to true it up and get it cutting well. So that can save some money. But in general, you want to avoid offsetting that for that purpose. There is another reason, however, to do it, and that is when you have no choice. And with this example here, if I wanted to grind this angle, regardless of which side it's turned on, well, I'm going to have to get in there. And for that, well, I need a form grinding wheel. And you can see here that the angle here, if I plunge in, will give me my angle. And I've left a small flat on the end here to come and finish that. In reality, how I do this one would be to come down to my diameter, touch it, get to the diameter I want, then 
feed laterally over and just come and plunge in on that side there to clean it up. Now if this diameter had to be really really accurate well, I'd probably plunge in straight and then go the other way. So, six of one, half a dozen of the other, it depends uh, what your philosophy is like. But there is another reason that I haven't mentioned for offsetting a little bit the grinding wheel. Remember that if I dress my wheel, true it up, it's the table, the lower table that controls that. So it's always going to dress parallel to the axis of this table if I'm dressing with that lower table. But if I incline the grinding wheel just slightly, I've exaggerated here in this drawing, if you can call that a drawing, I still shake a little bit, but anyhow, if I can exaggerate it here in this drawing, uh, if but I'm just maybe half a degree or a degree, and then I dress the wheel, I'll end up with a wheel that's a little out of kilter. It looks bizarre because it comes basically to a point there now. And not very much if it's just one degree, but it is a point. And what that permits me to do is to grind up to a shoulder without touching that side surface. If your wheel is straight, it's hard to get right up there without touching at least a little bit. And while you want to avoid that if you don't need to grind the end, this is a good way to get right into the corner uh, without touching the vertical surface. Now, one thing that I want to explain also is that aligning the grinding wheel, as we've just seen here, really isn't that important. I mean, if you want a specific angle, you can do it, but you have a scale on the work head, the, the, the work head that holds the grinding wheel, so it's, it's relatively easy to align. However, aligning the work or the, the, the tail of the headstock here, that can be a little like a nightmare. Not really, but it's way more complex. So if I was faced with the situation where I had to use one or the other, I would tend to, if possible, try to offset the grinding wheel. However, in some circumstances you have no choice, you offset the uh, fixed or the work head here, the headstock, sorry, I'm thinking in French and I'm speaking in English. So the headstock here, uh, it's it, to line it up, it, disalign it fine, but then you're going to have to work hard to get it to line up again. We're going to take a look at that now. We, we have a rough idea why we would want to offset the different components of this machine. Now we should take a look at how or what we need to do to realign them. So we have five things here that can be moved, but we don't have five that can be adjusted. We have the work head, we have the lower table, the upper table, we have the tailstock, and we have the headstock. Of those five components, two aren't adjustable, the lower table and the tailstock. What does that mean? Well, that means that you're going to have to trust the manufacturer that those entities are straight and true, as they should be. I mean, you can always check them, but you just check them once, and when you know that they are, well, you just suppose that they stay that way. Now, the tailstock, I said, isn't adjustable, but it is movable. It can slide up and down the table here to adjust for different lengths of work. Uh, but it is not adjustable side per side, neither is it up and down. The lower table isn't adjustable. It rides on the casting and it depends on the casting and its ways to make it run true or straight or whatever you want to call it. How would you check that though? Well, you could put an indicator on the edge of the table, on the side of the table, I should say, and cycle the table back and forth. And that would give you absolutely no information. Don't do that. You can't do that. If you put an indicator on the side of the lower table here and move the table back and forth, 
the indicator will always be in the same position relative to the table. Whether it was crooked, straight, or crooked the other way, the only way you would get movement on an indicator with that kind of setup would be if the table was bowed or warped. Then you'd catch a little movement on that. So you can't do that. So what would you do? There's only one axis of movement, and that's the back and forward movement of the work head. And that means that if you're going to want to check your lower table, you're going to have to mount a very accurate square on the side here to project a surface outwards at 90 degrees from the edge of the table. Then you can mount an indicator on your work head somewhere that will give you access to that square and indicate the square. That will tell you if your lower table is running true with the casting and perpendicular to the movement or the axis of the work head. So that's that. How about the upper table? Well, it pivots on the lower table. So if I wanted to get it straight or parallel with the lower table, that would be easy because all I would have to do is mount an indicator on its side. In this case, it works. Why? Because we have the subtable that moves in its direction back and forth, and the upper table is sitting on it. So if it is crooked, I'll see a variance or a change in my dial indicator, and that will indicate to me that it's not running parallel to the lower table. So, upper table, just mounting a dial indicator on it, that's all you really need to do here. You have, however, a scale on the end that you can rely on to well within, I would say, about 10 minutes of a degree. So, what's left? We have the work wheel that can be offset at an angle. As we said, we can turn the work head all the way around. And that doesn't change its axis of motion, it just changes the position of the grinding wheel. And as mentioned before, it's not difficult to realign because it doesn't have to be realigned very well. The difficult one here is the headstock. It pivots. And there's two things going on here, really. I could be chucking parts in there. And in that case, well, I could use the chuck to align the head to get it fine-tuned. But there's also this tailstock that isn't adjustable. And if this pivots and I want to hold things between centers, well, I'm going to have to align it to this at one point in time to get it realigned, in other words. So I don't have a cylindrical grinder in my shop. I don't have access at this time to the school shop that I filmed the rest of the sequences in. So we're going to check this out over on the mill with my spin indexer and the spin indexer is going to replace the headstock here. So I have my spin indexer mounted with one pivot point on the mill. I have a three jaw chuck. I have a test bar and I have my dial indicator. So we're ready to go. But we're coming up on our 20 minute mark and that's pretty well the limit of my attention span. So we'll stop here and we'll carry on in part three. Until then, have fun, be safe, and happy machining.